Safety Awareness Week is safety. Safety in everything that we do while we extend reality. For the simple reason that safety is critical to exploring these new innovation, to ensure the trust, to ensure the responsibility and accountability in everything that we do while we extend realities. So each year before the holidays, XRSI will promote this time of the year to ensure we engage with the XR technologies with safety at the forefront. Please enjoy this panel dedicated to art and media and awareness in all those domains. Hi, everybody. We're here today to talk about intellectual property challenges and how that is, it is um, important for the emerging arts and media like virtual reality. So I am Sonia Haskins. I'm going to be the moderator here today. And we've invited three special guests to join us. So I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. And then we'll come back around and start talking about this very important topic. Could you introduce yourself first, Isabel? Hi, I'm Isabel Mascarinas Whitman. I'm founder of Image Fiction Films, which is a film and VR company. And I've also cast many, many commercials for the world's leading tech brands. Yuji? Uh, my name is Eugene Kappen. I'm the CEO of Studio Kappen. We created the first inverse reality talk show to ever be ordered as if it was a TV show. I'm a social media futurist and a purposely bad stock photography model. <laughs> I'm Brian Wassum. I am an attorney at the law firm Warner Norcross and Judd. Uh, I'm based in the Detroit area. And I've been involved in the AR VR industry for the past decade. I've had opportunity to represent uh, some great clients in in space and uh, contribute um, from a thought leadership perspective in terms of uh, the the first book on augmented reality law and a variety of other publications. That's great. Thank you all for joining us. And as I said, my name is Sonia and I'm the founder of VR Community Builders. And we basically try to um, find ways to make VR inclusive and accessible to everyone. And there are a lot of topics that we think are important and this is one of them. So we appreciate XRSI giving us the forum and ability to be able to discuss this here today. We're going to start out for those of you who aren't really familiar with IP or intellectual property and let Brian give us a, a basic rundown of what that is and um, why you should be aware of, of it. Sure. So Intellectual property, broadly speaking, is uh, the protection for intangible property, intangible creations. And that's the bread and butter of what people in the creative arts are doing on, on a day-to-day -day basis. That is the primary asset that they, they create and that they own. And so this is vitally important to the, the folks that we're talking to today. Um, IP falls into a few well-known buckets um, that protect different uh, aspects of creativity. So uh, copyright, for example, uh, protects creative expression. That's, that's the type of law that protects books, movies, um, television, uh, art, visual arts, uh, anything that is a creative expression that is, falls under the realm of copyright law. Patent law protects uh, useful things, useful items, inventions, useful processes, uh, things that are utilitarian in value or protected by patent law. Trademark law is the law of uh, corporate identity or um, uh, goodwill in your brand. So the, the logo, the name that you use to identify your company or yourself in the marketplace and distinguish your goods and services from those uh, offered by others, that's the, the realm of trademark law. There, there are a few other buckets as well. Trade secrets are are kind of an in-between between, between uh, copyright and patent, things that aren't necessarily patentable but still useful for, because they're secret. Um, and then the right of publicity, uh, which sounds like UG is pretty familiar with uh, by having waived in some cir circumstances, but uh, is the, the commercial identity in your uh, personal identity, or commercial value rather, in your commercial identity and the law that protects your ability to uh, control the exploitation of that identity. Well, that actually brings me to my first question, which I want to direct to Isabel. And we're going to come back to Eugene later. That's a whole separate story there, <laughs> which we definitely are going to share with the viewers. But Isabel, I wanted to hop to you for a second. And when Brian's talking about 
um, the, like, for example, your likeness or images or whatever, things that you can protect or that we might have protections for. Um, how does that, what does that make you think of in far, as far as possibilities of um, protecting capture data, uh, likeness, like voice likeness, um, your body, things like that? How does this apply to immersive reality is what I'm asking you. So I think traditionally, um, the way that we view usage uh, in the non-XR world, um, we sort of take footage and you can take footage in a lot of different places and um, it's where you use the footage where uh, that, that's the point that um, people start needing releases and people need consents. In the XR world, obviously, it's a little bit different because you can get um, in, in a world where deepfakes exist, for instance, you can get repurposing of likenesses, you can get repurposing of um, your tracking data, <laughs> you can get somebody to, uh, you know, some, somebody can come and imitate you doing something that you'd never do. Um, and for talent, which is what I mainly deal with, um, I think the main concerns are maybe not so much for the A-list names, um, but actually for maybe more unknown talent um, who risk going in for one job and then finding uh, their, their data being repurposed for something else without their consent and without payment for it. Right. Yeah, I think that's important, but also from the perspective of um, the we want people to be paid for the work, obviously, and then also other people not use things as they shouldn't. But Eugene, how does that affect what you do? I was actually thinking of, of some of the things I've seen that you've made. Um, wouldn't that be important that we make sure the right people who are paying for the right things and are represented properly, like in what you do, wouldn't that make a difference? Like, like I definitely, I, I think the difference between what I do um, in terms of what I give away for free and what I, in terms of what I do uh, for a fee is usually uh, in terms of labor and in terms of appearance fee. Like, I don't mind that people are using my images to talk about education in VR or pornography in VR for that matter. Um, but where I do get paid is for the labor that I actually put forth into my various projects and the appearance fees I do whenever, say, I have to go do uh, a talking event at a college. Um, that's how I make my money. Uh, I knew long ago I'd probably be giving up my rights as um, an image on the internet early on just because of the way that things get memed and repurposed yeah. and, and recreated that eventually it would be out of my hands already. So I decided to just own the control of giving up those rights yeah. early on. Yeah, and we should clarify here because we didn't record the part telling about your images. So now I'm envisioning this is turning into a weird talk very quickly. People are watching this. Isabel, she came in after that. And so she's sitting there going, hmm. <laughs> so we're talking about Eugene's images. We should have had it ready to put on the screen. The VR images with him in a headset, in a headset with clothes on, <laughs> doing VR screenshots that people use. You made that sound very strange all of a sudden, Eugene. But okay. Okay, we're going to uh, move you, beyond that. <laughs> if it was good. I'll try to find out if we can, um, you know, somewhere have a picture of that. But they're very good and appropriate. And I agree with you. Sometimes it's better to just say, I'm doing this as a volunteer. I'm doing this for free. That's my choice because you can own that versus somebody stealing it. There's a huge difference there. But what I was actually referring to when I was asking you that question, I was kind of thinking about the, um, the experiences you do create. Like, wouldn't that bother you if someone took one of those experiences that you did create for money that you put a lot of time and invested into and then tried to just recreate, let's say, um, uh, that setting or whatever without giving you any attribution or pay for that? That's kind oh, of what I had. Oh, absolutely. I mean, those pieces of property are, you know, copywritten. Like, I have legal protections for somebody stealing my projects that I actually put forth and, you know, get money for. I mean, there, there's a vast difference between the two. Um, we always, you know, make sure that we have legal protections put into place whenever we create some sort of original content and not say we're doing the like four quadrant method where we're buying into a fandom and creating content specifically around that for the internet. Right. Well, and Isabel might want to talk to this, but I wanted to ask you, Brian, specifically, 
isn't there some sort of understood um, understood IP there? Of course, like you were talking about tangible versus intangible, for example. So um, we have people like Rosie and um, one of the VR artists and uh, other artists that we have that do some amazing artwork in VR. Now, anybody with any sense is going to know if you go and you you grab a, a Van Gogh or another painting, you know, that's, that's protected and you should have... Um, ask permission for an artist that's doing work, you just ask them permission to say, make posters that are reprinted. But what about someone who has artwork that they created in VR? You know, what if you want to take that artwork and then let's say Eugene had a, a world he creates and he just takes that artwork and puts it in his world. Isn't that something that is probably protected by IP that they shouldn't be doing without permission? Yes. <laughs> I can elaborate, but yes, the, the answer is yes. Uh, th so copyright laws is written uh, intentionally uh, broadly in terms of the medium that it applies to. Any medium can can contain copyrighted expression. It, it doesn't matter what medium it's expressed in. And we, we uh, verified that at the very early age of computer uh, assisted art, uh, digital art, um, you know, courts consistently held that just because it's digital, just because it consists of pixels rather than paint, um, it doesn't make it any less expressive, doesn't make it any less um, uh, protectable by copyright law. The copyright statute says any tangible medium of expression, um, and that includes the digital the realm. So whether that is a two-dimensional digital image at the time of your screen or a three-dimensional image that you experience through VR makes no difference as long as it has uh, that, that bare minimum of, of original expression by the artist, it's protectable by copyright law. Yeah, that's great. Do you think that at some point someone will challenge that? Like they'll try to say it's not protected and there'll end up having to be cases um, about that in the future, specifically related to the 3D art involved with VR? I mean, do you foresee that in the future? Like we're trying to very much avoid specific, there aren't any specific cases, just to clarify for everybody watching this, this is not legal advice and we wanted to make that clear this isn't anything specific we're just discussing generalizations and so one of the things that interested me is i think that probably in the future because vr is growing as a medium some of these things we're talking about today probably will show up in the courts in the future i would think don't you think so uh, i actually have an example i participated and i had a great opportunity to litigate a case uh in that involving exactly this question this goes back 10 or more years ago out of it originated out of Utah, but uh, just in a, in a nutshell, um, it, it involved whether or not the three dimensional digital recreation of an actual vehicle, an actual car for marketing purposes uh, was protectable by copyright law. Um, as it happens, the particular image in that case was not copyrightable. That's only because it was uh, an exact duplication of a real world object. So it didn't have anything to do with the fact that it was digital. It had to do with the fact that it was just a recreation, not creative original expression. But in the process of ruling on that case, you know, the, that court and several other courts since have made clear that it's you, you can you can protect digital uh, creative art just as much as you could any other sort of physical medium. Okay, that's great. And I'm glad you brought that up. That's interesting. You know, people can use that as a reference in their minds to see what's happening. Yes, Eugene. Uh, uh, I would like to bring up, there was a case in Second Life years ago where there was a glitch in the system. And because Second Life, it does have a monetary value to the work that was created in terms of assets and furniture and world building. Uh, the glitch basically made duplicates of everything in the server. And so people were taking the duplicate item and reselling it without the permission and it actually led to a lawsuit. Wow. And the judge actually yeah. ruled in favor of the artists creating original content. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there have been other Second Life cases also. And, I'm, and a lot of times when I'm giving a talk, I'll use the, these two cases as, as bookends. The, the first, the one I mentioned, an example of how a recreation a precise recreation of a real world object in VR is not copyrightable. But then on the other side is, is just a creative interpretation. It, it can be certainly a recreation based on a real life object, a particular um, 
take on a real life object, but just because it's it, it's a painting or a digital image of something that exists doesn't make it not copyrightable in the way that the artist is expressed. And there's a second live case comes out of New York, says the same thing. Basically, someone hired uh, an artist to create an island for them in Second Life, and then they took that island and and did things with it they weren't allowed to do, and the artist prevailed. That's interesting. Yeah, I think that's great because it's going to these things are going to matter as we see increased usage and populations in worlds like um, you know alt space or horizon or whatever it is. We're going to have these questions come up, so we need to be aware of. Um, first of all, what the apps rules are on these things, you know, are they, are they being created for communal purposes or, and have people released any rights? Is that something that we also should ask? Or is it something where they are, um, you know, they are our IP? I mean, is that, in, that's another question too. I guess there are some situations where when you create something, they are being made for the community as a whole. And so you understand that other people are going to use them, but we can, hop back to that question in a second. I wanted to ask Isabel real quick. Um, Isabel, what about, let's switch gears for just one minute. Um, and what about a person's likeness or their voice? Cause I think that affects you a little bit more. And is that something that we all should also should be looking at as a protected property? So the example I gave you when we were discussing this about email is if I go to a basketball game, you know, for example, and someone's taking pictures, well, you can assume you're in a large social space and somebody's going to take your photograph and um, that might be put on wherever social media or pub publicity um, shots or whatever. Uh, let's say you're in VR in a large social space and that happens. The same thing, you can assume always, I always assume when I go into multiplayer VR that it's being recorded and potentially streamed. I think we all should assume that all the time and be cautious of what we say and do. Um, however, what if you have the presumption that you're going into a private area with someone and, you know, I, what are your I, protections I would, there? So I, I would say, firstly, even if I am in a public space in VR um, I would expect to know if there are other organizations that might be siphoning my data I, I would expect that um, the idea that anybody could be doing that is uh, something that I think um, yeah a, a lot of consumers would be very concerned about um, going into a private space um, that would be an agreement that you make with the person um, I think possibly this is maybe more more Brian's, but that uh, I believe would be a, a contract that you made going into a private space. Uh, so they would be limited as to what they could use the footage for. Um, but I also think uh, the idea that in a public space, you could be just giving away your tracking data, um, things that personally identify you. Uh, to, to any organization and you may not be aware of it is, is highly concerning. I'm not talking about that so much as just, for example, um, things you say, like if you're in, if we were recording this right now at a shopping mall, there's, we have to make the assumption there's always the possibility somebody standing around us has a phone and they're recording us. Oh. That's what I'm talking about. And so if you're in a public space, a multiplayer game or something in VR, sure. then you, you should always assume somebody might be streaming to Twitch or whatever. And so I think that would fall under just, you know, that's just general common sense. You have to recognize there may be someone recording yeah. you. I'm not talking about companies. I'm talking about individuals. Yeah. Uh, so there are exemptions, um, I know in the UK and Australia, I'm not sure about in the US, um, I think these are sort of vaguely universal things, um, news, criticism, parody and satire, um, so and I think news spreading to sort of current affairs, um, if you are in a big public space, uh, Again, it's it's about what people are planning to use the footage for. So if I film you in in a public arena and then I use that footage for something uh, commercial or even for a documentary project where I misrepresent you, then all of these things uh, you have reason to um, come to me and say no, <laughs> I didn't consent to do that. But if I use you incidentally. Um, and it's not for a commercial purpose. Uh, as in in a documentary, for instance, that would be reasonable use, I think. Although 
it, it may be something that somebody would, would approach you um, with litigation for anyway. That's the exact example I was looking for you to, to discuss. I mean, exactly. And do you agree with that, Brian, that people would have the right to do that? Or, you know, that if someone's using it for misuse, they can come say something, but um, otherwise you're in that public space. And so there's a bit of understanding that you, you also have to have some awareness of what's going on around you. It's an interesting question because it, it, it starts to get to uh, to unpeel the, the the facade off of the metaphors that we use because um, you know we talk about things being public spaces as if they're an actual space right in VR and not just a, a digital stream of, of, of ones and zeros. Um, yeah, we it, it is it is generally true as, as a as a general proposition that if you're in a public place, you know, your people are free to record you. Uh, you don't have an in, in, in expectation of privacy, which is what it boils down to, right? And and here it's, it's worth noting that we're kind of we're kind of straying a little bit from intellectual property law to privacy. They're they're certainly uh, related, especially when it comes to your image rights. But they're they're different questions. Um, but when you are in a VR space, um, nothing is truly public, right? Everything's a walled garden uh, to some extent or other at this point, right? We 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 don't have a a ready player one environment where we're all just, you know, walking around in the same platform. There's some, you know, cross platform capabilities and, and such, but it is all a privately created space that we log into. And when there's bound to be a service agreement that we click through in order to get into that space. Um, not only that, but if people are recording, they're not recording you, they're recording your avatar that you see, which is, which is in a digital image created by some artist uh, who uh, is behind the creation of the space, behind the creation of the experience in the first place. So there's a different question here if you're in, in terms of recording a person versus their avatar that they didn't necessarily create and they don't necessarily own the rights to. Um, and, and, we, and a lot of the things that we would otherwise take for granted as being just physical objects in the background, for example, in, in real life, well, in VR, all of that stuff is created by somebody. All of it is potentially copyrightable expression. So uh, so, so no, it's actually quite a more fraught question, um, and, and there's a bit more legal exposure, and you need to know a lot more about the particular circumstances that you're in to know whether you have the same presumption of being able to record what's around you in a virtual space as opposed to a physical one. Yeah, that's a good answer, and I, I'm glad you pointed that out because sometimes, of course, it is a little easy to cross those over, especially if you are the the average consumer. I mean, like with me, I'm not... I'm not an attorney. And so my interest lies more in um, as a user, what are the rights I have? And also as a person who goes into VR and creates things, you know, what are my rights there that differ versus say, for example, in a multiplayer space, like with Israel was saying, I would hope that you, you do have the ability and that does ponder more in privacy. But if you, you have the ability of someone records you and misuses it, as I've actually had happen, oddly enough, Isabel, as well as glad to use that example. And someone comes in and then they they go and use, misuse that material. It's like, you would hope you would have the ability to say, you know, you said you weren't recording this, but you did and now you misused it. And so, you know, that is a different topic than IP though. So I want to hop back to that. And specifically with Eugene and Isabel, what can people, um, content creators or, people who are creating talent creators, what can they do to protect the intellectual property that they are making that is being used for immersive media? You want to go first or do you want me? Okay. Um, so at the moment, uh, there are things that uh, are being looked at, but there's not a lot for uh, talent to sort of say, I want this in my contract. I think, um, metadata um with uh capture is is something that can be used with blockchain to provide a record of a, a true likeness and then you can see where it's being repurposed that's that's something that could that could happen that could provide talent with a way to see uh that their data is is being used in the way that they wanted it to be um, but it's it's not happening at the moment. At the moment, perhaps it's it's not 
that necessary because what we're capturing is rudimentary but I think uh, with vocal likeness and motion tracking those things uh, you you need so little of them to produce a, a unique replica of that person um, that's yeah probably the most concerning aspect and I think once we start um, incorporating some way of uh, including identifying metadata with with that data that will be um that that will sort of sew that up okay okay when when we talk about um <clears throat> online performances in terms of doing it through a digital avatar i think there's a couple of things we need to take into note one is the fact that there may be monetary value to a specific performance and that performance, if they're not being paid, would reside with the uh, performer, uh, not the avatar itself. Um, in a couple of different states here in the United States, uh, we do have laws against um, being recorded, um, having your voice recorded without consent or knowledge, and that may come up in court. Uh, there was a really famous uh, legal battle with Lindsay Lohan where she was talking to a producer that she asked if it was being recorded. They said, no, it got leaked online. And she in turn sued because she didn't want it coming out there. Um, the same with digital avatars. I, I think that if you take the extra, st extra steps to own the content in which you're presenting yourself in, uh, when we did glitched, I actually flew down to Los Angeles and got a duplication scan of myself. So I had my physical likeness presented on stage. So there was no question of whether or not I actually own the rights to my likeness through that uh, performance whenever I did an episode. Um, so I, I really think it comes down to um, what certain rights are you giving up when you're working with a production studio? Um, you may have, you know, an artist that is contracted um, to build these avatars. And if it's just a private contractor, the artist might argue for ownership of the avatar. But if they're, say, like an employee and the platform is hiring them per hourly, the platform is actually going to own rights to the avatar and they wouldn't be able to argue personalization uh, in performances in that aspect. Okay, that's good. I think all those answers really give us a, a good basis for the topic. And just to make it clear for people that are watching this, if we're gonna have a wide range of people with knowledge of this subject. And so I want to give a, a hard example here, but. If I, I, I'm an author, I actually write books and articles and stuff. And so if someone, if I have a book that has my name on it and it says, my name is author, you know, it's easy for people to understand that falls under copyright, copyright laws. They can't just copy that and resell it. Um, we do have issues online. I do a lot of digital work and we have, you know, I'll print articles and sometimes people will take those articles and reprint them. They just remove my byline and they'll literally just reprint them, which is a very blatant, you know, violation of copyright. And so I guess I want to ask each of you from your own perspectives, why is this discussion even important? So like, even for me as a writer, I foresee that in the future, these things will matter. And so right now, like Isabel said, it's not so much an issue right now, but is this an important topic that we should be, we should be thinking about as far as what, um, what is to come and what kind of problems do you see might arise and um, why should we be addressing this now? Would you like to take on that first, Brian? Sure. I mean, I think that it's already a topic that's important to a great number of people that are working in this space. I know it's important to my clients um, when they call and ask me how they can protect the things that they're already investing a lot of time and effort into. Uh, it's just going to continue to grow as the medium grows. And I think that we're all here under this shared assumption that XR is the future and in the direction that media is going to move increasingly towards. 
Uh, people want to, I think, instinctively experience things the way that their physical sensations, their physical five senses are geared to experiencing them. That's in three dimensions. That's with multiple uh, senses. Uh, and that's the, the sort of experience that, that XR uh, offers people. So um, the, the, this is really not a new conversation. It's just taking um, the same principles that we've worked with as a society for hundreds of years and applying it to the, the next iteration of uh, mass media. Yeah, it's true. It really is true. We've had these discussions before. And I think as you were talking, you didn't specifically address this. I want to let you two answer that question, but it's funny. I think we have to remember too that even though the medium has changed, a lot of this also boils down to money. You know, if you're taking time and energy and creating something, you want to be rewarded for that work. For me personally, money doesn't mean a lot to me, but I can tell you when I spend seven hours writing an article, the last thing I want is for somebody else to stick that on their page and take my name off of it. And so, you know, I think you're right that the mediums have changed, but the point is still when people work hard to do things, they, they deserve the credit for that. So, all right, Eugene, why is this important to you, this topic? Uh uh, I think it's incredibly important because as somebody who works in the entertainment industry, if I, li like you said, if I put a lot of time into something, uh, I don't want someone to come along without my knowledge, take what I've built and go make a million dollars off of it and, you know, leave me without a cent and all my work is essentially stolen, right? Yeah. Um, I feel that I want control over the properties that I create, my likeness, and the other aspects that I control. That's why I think getting legal counsel or um, a copyright lawyer is incredibly important for the things that I create. And I would advise anybody to do the same. Isabel, your takes a little bit different because I think for you, you're actually protecting other people as opposed, you're thinking about other people as opposed to necessarily yourself. So how would you answer that question? Well, I think in the XR space, you now have consumers who are appearing just like you would have book talent. So actually that uh, line between talent and consumer um, is, is disappearing really. And actually one of the things I do is, is real people casting. So documentary style, I, I get people who aren't um, experienced performers and I get them to uh, perform. <laughs> and I think we're gonna see more of that in the XR space. And uh, I think one of the reasons why it's so important is because, uh, well, we're talking about full impersonation, really. It's the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> it's, it's like somebody potentially wearing your face. So, yeah, it, it is very important as we move forward with it. Um, yeah. Well, um, that is funny. We start laughing because I think all of us had at least a little bit of experience where somebody's maybe pretended to be you somewhere at some time or whatever, and it's a little creepy. <laughs> so not only is it disturbing on a you know, legal sense, but it's also just creepy. <laughs> but um, I was thinking as well, the last question, we'll each go over this and I'll let you have an opportunity to discuss anything else you like. But um, we have a lot of developers, game developers, or um, people who are making apps and stuff that are allowing people to use their IP, which is which is great. I think that's fantastic. Uh, that brings us back full circle to Eugene's Pictures, who has given permission to people to use some of those images. And so right now, let's try to focus on the positive side of this just a little bit. We've talked about how people shouldn't take um, take intellectual property and use it without permission. And obviously we have issues we're gonna to need to address and things are protected, but right now, because the industry is still small and growing, do you think it's important for, to some degree, um, people to recognize that some of the uh, IP that's out there that's being shared is being done so through um, uh, altruistic motives. Like people are choosing to do that because they want to grow the industry. Um, is that the case? And is that a good thing? Eugene looks totally confused. You know, like Eugene, people are, are sharing things because they want to help the industry grow. So um, don't you think that's the case? I've seen I, that. So. I, <laughs> <laughs> you look like completely uh, Call me confused. out. I'm, I'm not confused. I'm, I'm actually debating whether or not I should 
Because because this isn't a real face on me right now. <laughs> you just need more coffee. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I'm serious. I'm um I'm using digital tools right now to make myself look better on camera. Are you really? Yeah. So if I say I wanted to be <laughs> a small child, I absolutely could. Okay, that's a little creepy now. Now I'm freaked out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I, I just took 25 years off my face, right? Can you take uh, them off mine? Uh, I I could, but I gotta do some setup on your side. Really? After yeah. be still? Uh, no, no, no. I I would have to download a set of programs and oh, oh, okay. do it. <laughs> like Brian and Isabel, are like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so now you made me completely forget the question. Uh, we Don't were you guys think about... there's, there's some goodness out there? There's some good people are sharing out people. We need, I, I guess I think the topic's important because even if people do that, we shouldn't ever forget what Brian was saying. That there's still a legal point there. They still own this. You can just choose to share it if you want to. Okay. Yeah, I, I think creating new pieces of content and tools to better the industry, of, of course, is a great foundational point for everybody, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships and that's really how we should be looking at those sort of things that's why i'm all down for giving away free stuff to make the industry a little bit better as a whole in terms so when we grow you know we're getting towards you know that 20 billion dollar industry mark you know there's going to be more money in the ecosystem so we can all make more money later on right yeah Sorry, you're still thinking about the baby. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about the baby and now your earlier comments about your pictures. You've got me totally distracted now. <laughs> okay, Isabel, what about you? Do you think it can be, you know, is it good for us to share some things as well? I wonder about that in your case, because um, in your case, I would think maybe that's not the best thing because you need people to be able to make money as a uh, in your job, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I well, I don't know. I, I believe that you know you, you should have the right <laughs> to put things out um, out there for free. But yeah, uh, people should also you know people should be paid and people should value their work and expect to be paid um, for their contributions. Um, but I also think uh, if you if you look at the way that we've accepted deep fakes exist and that, that sometimes it, you know even though we can sort of they're, they're very good now and you you can look at them and you can say gosh i really you know you can you can barely tell they're only going to get better and we've we've kind of accepted uh that actually that's something that can be done and then it's it's up to the person to say no no i never said that i wasn't there and i suppose that will go that will yeah go forth into the xr space it, you will you know then you'll be able to deny being in a place <laughs> deny um yeah uh, deny uh saying things if if you are impersonated um but regarding being putting putting things that you you wanted to into the space uh i think it's yeah it's something that should be encouraged uh, i don't think all but yeah all vr presence should be monetized at all go back just a second for the people who are watching this who may not know um because a lot of people who watch the things i do are they're very new to vr and to the industry so before we move on to brian explain exactly what you're talking about there because i know that i can guarantee you some people are going to ask me what's she talking about like when you say deep fake or people are going to use that image i mean i know what you're talking about but as far as um how people are doing that give them an example like tell the uh, actual example instead of trying to define it give me an example of what you're talking about so they'll understand how is this bad like how can somebody use your likeness for bad do you understand what i'm asking you are you pointing that towards? Brian? Yeah, Isabel. No, oh, Isabel. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I thought we cut out. I'm like, man, Eugene's broken us all now. She can't even hear me. <laughs> then Wait, we'll go I'm to Brian. Still very much here. Um, okay, so uh, I think. Um, oh, well, we've we've seen music being used recently where people haven't given permission to give a certain message uh for instance you could take a, a famous actor you could have them saying things uh that were unacceptable and they could 
uh, yeah, <laughs> they could be very upset at that. That that's the way that it could be. Um, a sort of repurpose is. Was that the question? Yeah, I think it is. I guess I'm trying to. I'll give an example of why this is a problem in VR. Let's say, um, let's say I have the the authority to train people, or not just authority, but you know, a, a reputation for training and helping people in virtual reality. Because we're talking about being in the virtual environments here, and um, the. Uh, you have that reputation. So someone comes in and sees that name there. Let's say my name's Hasco7 in game and sees my avatar and they come up expecting me to help them because they know that that's traditional. And then I start doing something inappropriate instead. Well, that would be an example, I think, where if someone has recorded my voice and starts using that voice as a cover over what you're talking about, I'm trying to give them a real life example of why this is a problem in immersive reality, because it's even more so, I would think, you're you're um, talking about like a video example where you can say put somebody in a commercial and make them say something they're not supposed to but in vr someone might actually think that's that person they're doing those those actions and stuff does that make sense so that's what i'm trying to give people who don't necessarily even do vr an understanding of what we're talking about they may even think it's the real person if they use your voice and they've recorded your voice and use it and then they just have an avatar and they change their name to look like yours, that's a problem because we don't want someone to think someone is, is another person. They're pretending to be another person. I think Brian understands what I'm trying to say here. Can you um, speak to that? And with all that together, Isabel laid the groundwork there and I tried to explain a little further, but try to put all that together and say why wow, this is a problem. Well, it, it destroys um, trust. In, in the content. And it can be incredibly damaging to it, the reputations of the individuals that are misconstrued. Uh, we've already seen it in political content where um, someone will use deep fake video technology to create a video that appears to be a particular politician saying something that, you know, is the complete opposite of anything they would actually say in real life. Putting that content out there, you know, soon before an election, for example, to to alarm the populace and 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 affect the, the outcome of the vote, people reacting to things that aren't true, but they don't know that it's not true. Um, and the the more the more realistic, the more believable this video content becomes, the the harder it becomes then to to prove that no, that really wasn't me saying that. Um, we just we, we completely threatens the uh, trustworthiness of not only um, VR but all digital media and, and any broadcast medium that relies on video um, and the political system that goes with it. We're already seeing you know the the seeds of that being planted uh, even now in the political system in the U.S. So I think that deepfakes only threaten to uh, uh, exacerbate that problem. Okay, so last thing to finish this up, I want to know if you have any kind of advice, if each of you has any advice or last comments on what we can do about this. And I meant to tell you one, one thing that made me think about this, there have been situations in VR that I've been concerned about with the example I just gave, for example, but also um, a, a couple of weeks ago before I proposed the panel, there was another situation where someone was sending me um, information about uh, some things somebody said. And I happened to notice, just happened to notice that the, um, the images they were sending me, there was one thing slightly off compared to what the user normally uses. I was like, that's not even real. It's, it's not even real, like it had been created. And so it got me thinking about all this in terms of some of the things I've seen in VR too, like, wow, it really is true. Like you say, it's gonna get harder to identify Brian. And, you know, and Isabel's talking about deep fakes. I think it is very, very important because we're not just talking about something in print or in digital media we look at. We're actually talking about if we are in immersive reality with those people in that situation. When I say in, I know Brian that we're across digital you know, <laughs> paths there, but when you do VR a lot, and you, you use it. I mean, to me, it does feel like I'm really in there. You know, I'm immersed in there. And so that concerns me that I might think I'm in VR with you, for example, when it's really who knows who, you know. And so I think it is something when you think about with that in mind and all the things we've talked about today. And I realize there's a crossover, too, between the privacy issues and security and um, IP. But what can we do about this? Do you have any last comments of things that we can be, should we just be watching out for this issue? Or is there anything we can do now to try to stop this stuff from happening? 
you want to go first? Um, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> uh, I think one of, one of the main things uh, that we can try and do is work out where our data will be stored. To know where our data will be stored, who will have our data, when it will be deleted. Um, if, if uh, as, a, as advice to talent and agents um, of talent, I would say it's really important to know uh, how much of the data will be kept um, when uh, doing an XR shoot. Um, and as an individual, I think it's really important to look at what you're agreeing to when you agree to various user agreements, who will have that data, um, the sort of spaces that you're going into, um, who will have the data, how long they will have the data for. That's great, thanks. That's a good answer, Isabel. Eugene? Uh, I think, uh, last advice, I think spending time, if you're a creator or somebody who works with other creators in this capacity where you're actively in a VR space, I think knowing just even a little bit about copyright law and the do's and don'ts in terms of what you own, what the tools you're using to create content actually means um, is incredibly beneficial. I think having representation or at least a uh, like a lawyer or some sort of counsel who is very knowledgeable on this subject matter so you can call with actual questions when you have them is incredibly important, especially if you're making original IP. Um, and then, you know, watch out for people stealing identities in VR. Don't do it. Don't pretend to be other people that you're not, unless it's a specific character that you are, you know, using as an alter ego. Brian? Yeah, I mean, it, Eugene took the words out of my mouth. That's usually, uh, I'm usually the guy <laughs> telling people, uh, make sure you have a lawyer. So I'm glad, glad to hear it. Uh, but it, it, it's true, right? I mean, if I wanted to create in VR and I wanted to learn how to do that, I would have somebody teach me who knew what they were doing. So um, if you want to, get uh, legal protection in the things that you're creating uh, makes sense to to talk to somebody who does that every day and, and have them guide you but uh, beyond that I, I, I both what Isabel and Eugene said is, is right on I think the only thing I have to add to that uh, would be you know a, a version of the, the golden rule if you're uh, if you're doing something with uh, other people's content that you wouldn't want them to do with yours it may be think twice about that I love what all of you have said, and I like the way it all ties together. And I was sitting there thinking, okay, Eugene, he's he's pointing up to Brian, <laughs> taking the words out of his mouth, because it is important. We need to know, especially with Isabel and Brian, both of them serve other people in a way where they have knowledge that they're sharing with others. I think that's that's good to point out that we sometimes need to go to others and let them take care of the stuff we don't know. And um, But coming back to what you said, Eugene, it's important that we also are part of community of people that know things more than we do. And so if you are a content creator or if you're a talent, if you have talent, you know, get involved with the talent agencies or the, the communities of content creators. And I think also um, some people, even though they may be watching this and they don't like being around other people a lot, I personally think you touched on it, Eugene, but I personally think it's important to let people know you and put yourself out there a bit, because if you develop a reputation for being a jerk, well, people are going to know you're, you're a jerk. And if you develop a reputation for being a helpful person or, and you know, a person that has the answers or a kind person or whatever, they're going to know that. And so I feel like if you do that, that's going to help with some of the issues you guys brought up where when someone abuses your, you know, abuses that and tries to say something different or show something different, you already have a reputation established. And so that's a good thing to, to have. And you kind of touched on that, Eugene. I don't know if you meant to, but it was a good point getting to know other people and networking because networking is important. Well, thank you guys very much for um, taking the time to be here today. We're definitely glad all the viewers were here. And I think um, whoever's uh, people are watching online we have a little bit of opportunity for question and answer so you can just type in your questions there and i hope you all have a great day so thanks for joining us